for more on what we can expect from the UN General Assembly, let's go now to Paul Bledsoe. He's served on the White House Climate Change Task Force under US President Bill Clinton. He now heads the consulting firm Bledsoe & Associates, advising climate change organisations. Thank you very much for your time, Paul. Now, how are world leaders expected to highlight the world's climate concerns at the UNGA? Well, I am confident that there will be new announcements by the Biden administration and by nations around the world, but I'm also confident they will not be enough. Uh, we are in a climate crisis right now. Climate change impacts are costing thousands of lives and hundreds of billions of dollars right now, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse. And I don't think that global leaders yet really understand that climate change could destabilize their economies, their agriculture, their uh, immigration. This is a, a, a problem more profound than any we've ever faced. And it's really time that our leaders started leveling with us about it. Is it a lack of understanding or a lack of willingness, do you think? I mean, despite positive policy developments in the US and the EU, the international push to put the world back on track to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century is certainly lacking. What are the main barriers, really, do you think? It, it's both. It's, it's a natural human denial of a possible catastrophe, and it's our leaders who are not going to be facing the worst of it, who tend to be older, who are, you know, making excuses. And the U.S. has finally passed a very important climate law. The EU is acting. We need to work more with China. China is the largest emitter in the world. We need to get Russia back in the fold of nations somehow, separate or at least separate China and other nations from Russia so that we can get most nations that are major emitters reducing their emissions. But we also have to begin to put real money into climate change adaptation and resilience. We already have a probably about 1.5 C warming in the system that's going to be unavoidable. But we can protect against utter catastrophe. There was a report last week in Nature magazine that the Arctic sea ice may be disappearing altogether within a couple of decades. I wrote with my colleagues Derwood Zelke and Gabby Dreyfus on this in the New York Times last year. We need a global methane treaty. Every nation beginning to cut their methane emissions radically to reduce near-term temperatures and prevent the Arctic sea ice from disappearing, because if we don't, we're not just talking about sea level rise around the world. We're talking about changing the weather systems all around the world because warming will go over two degrees and maybe even over three degrees. This is the scale of the challenge. And speaking of catastrophes, the scale of the damage in Pakistan has led to cries from developing countries on the need for finance to help climate victims recover. But wealthy nations have for years opposed opening a new channel of funding to pay for the losses and damages caused by climate-related disasters. How might the tragedy in Pakistan be a turning point in that conversation, do you think? That's a great question, Sally. One option is to figure out a way to finance uh, these uh, large needed transfers of money for both adaptation and clean energy through systems that help the countries themselves become more sustainable. So, for example, can we do a, a debt forgiveness for climate action? That's one big theory that could happen. Many of these poorer nations are deeply in debt, so the debt is dragging down their ability to make the investments. Another thing I think we have to begin to consider is border carbon taxes, where countries uh, who are major emitters and, and have high emissions begin to pay a border tax when their goods are exported abroad. We need to think globally about ways to transfer money to poorer countries so they can be protected. Because if we don't, we're talking about destabilizing dozens of countries around the world, seeing mass migration, uh, agricultural uh, water shortages, starvation. This is the this is really the the greatest challenge we've ever faced, and it's time we started acting like it. 
And high energy prices are leading to a rollback of energy access in developing countries. That's something that the fossil fuel industry is certainly taking advantage of. How can governments work to end fossil fuel subsidies at a time when people, countries, are struggling with soaring energy prices? So Russia's uh, illegal invasion of Ukraine has created a real, really large problem for Europe and other nations who have been dependent on natural gas. So Europe's allies, like the U.S. and others, have to send gas to Europe in the short run. But in the long run, we need to move to hydrogen power. And we need to start making those very large investments. We'll need gas for several decades. It's just the truth. But we need to phase out oil a little more quickly than we are right now. And then we need to make these very large investments in infrastructure that can truly change the game. Hydrogen is probably one of them. All right, Paul, thank you very much for your insight and your time. Paul Bledsoe there, uh, former White House Climate Change Task Force and uh, worked for President Bill Clinton. Kazakhstan's a